Hey guys, Roger Holder here. Here's a question for your Turbo LS guys. When you run E85, does the intercooler help? In this video, we're going to take a look at a comparison on a Turbo 4.8 liter. We ran this combination with E85, both intercooled and non-intercooled. I've got all kinds of cool data for you. We ran it at different boost levels. I've got different charge temperatures. I've got back pressure. All kinds of cool stuff. Let's get going. Before we get to our test, we need to check out our test motor. It is a 4.8 liter LR4, stock block, stock crank, Gen 4 rods, and a set of forged JE small dome pistons. I've run this combination a ton, and it just keeps going and going. We topped it with a set of 706 stock heads, just with a valve spring upgrade, to work with our JFR cam. Now, I'll go ahead and put the specs up on that cam. It's one of the cams I tested in the Sloppy Stage 2 versus the world, the and a pretest. <laughs> we also have a stock truck manifold, stock truck throttle body, a set of uh, Snake Eater 1500 pound injectors because we're running, you know, big power and E85. We need the big injectors. The turbo kit consists of stock truck manifolds feeding a custom Y pipe. All of that exhaust is fed to a 7875 Gen 2 turbo from BS Racing. And in our intercooled form, we've got a Pro Charger air to water intercooler. In the non intercooled form, we just have a simple U bend to replace the intercooler. So, what are we waiting for? Let's make some noise! Now that everyone's excited, got to hear the motors run, let's take a look at the dyno results. Take a look at this. This is our 4.8 liter with our single VS Racing Turbo, and this is in non-intercooled form. Basically what we did was just put this U-bend in place of the intercooler and ran it with the same position on the TC1 Turbo Boost Controller, and I'll go ahead and show you that. And for you guys that are interested in the timing curve, which everybody seems to be, I'll go ahead and show a short a quick clip of that. You can kind of see if we look at the uh, 154 mark and go across, it starts out at about 13.6 degrees at 3000 RPM on the load in, and then it will go all the way across over and eventually get to 22 degrees, and that's at about, so this is roughly about seven pounds. So run in this manner with E85, our 4.8 liter, our cammed 4.8 liter, with non-intercooled trim on the E85, produce 579 horsepower. Oh, I take that back, 575.8 horsepower and 529.6 foot-pounds of torque. You know, this is a good curve. It's very low boost. Um, it works well, but let's see what happens now when we compare that to our intercooled version. This is after we added this uh, Pro Charger air-to-water intercooler. It has a three and a half in and a three and a half out. We had ambient dyno water running through this, which is about 69 degrees or 70 degrees right now. We uh, obviously have a <laughs> steady supply of that because we've got a 2,500 gallon uh, tank for the dyno. So there's plenty of water flow and we regulate the flow with a, um, bas basically a ball valve to find out how much uh, water is going through there. So here's what happened when we ran this. And remember, we ran this at the same timing curve, exactly the same spot, same position on the boost controller and same air fuel. So everything was the same. The only thing that changed was the addition of the intercooler. And we're gonna take a look and see what happened with the charge temperature differences because I monitored the charge temperature and we can take a look and see what the difference was, how much hotter it was without the intercooler. But run with the air to water intercooler, the Turbo 4.8 produced 604 horsepower and 558 foot pounds of torque. And as you can see, 
there were gains everywhere. I mean, having an intercooler obviously is a good idea. It does make more power. Now, it's up to you whether you guys think, hey, well, I can just raise the boost and get this. Yeah, you can. But an intercooler is always better because it doesn't just add power. It also adds safety. So <laughs> you're, much, you're much more likely to get the detonation with non-intercooled application, even on the 85, although that's not going to happen with this kind of safe tune and, you know, E85 at this low boost level. So now let's take a look and see what happened with the charge temperatures. Now let's take a look at the horsepower and torque curves offered by the intercooled versus non-intercooled 4.8 at 7 pounds. Let's take a look at the charge temperature. This is monitored in the discharge tube after the turbo but before the intake manifold. Run non-intercooled, our air temperature started at 114 degrees and rose to a peak of 157 degrees. It was still climbing as we shut off at 6800 RPM. Now some of this rise is obviously due to the sensitivity of the Type A thermocouple. It just takes time for it to register and we would see this thing keep climbing and then eventually probably get to a plateau and kind of level off and stabilize. But let's take a look now and see what happened. Um, we can still take a look at differences between the two because there was a big difference in charge temperature with and without the intercooler. So this is the red now is with the intercooler. So it started out much lower, started out at 63 degrees and only rose to 75.8 degrees. So it <laughs> even at seven pounds of boost, the non-intercooled version had about twice as much charge temperature as the intercooled version and this is important not just for power we were looking at power in the previous graph but also as i said for detonation i mean higher charge temperatures more likely to detonate so intercooling obviously worked and this is why we see more power the ideal thing would be it would be kind of cool to have um an air meter or mass flow meter on the turbo so we could correlate this a little bit more with you know we could count the oxygen molecules that actually went into the motor which is very cool so now let's take a look and see the same comparison at like 10 pounds taking a look at the horsepower and torque and the charge temperatures at seven pounds we need to take a look at the same combination run at a little higher boost we ran it at ten and a half pounds even though this thing up here says 11 I'm going to talk about that in just a second because even though we didn't change the boost controller setting we actually had a little bit more boost on the uh, non intercooled run than we did on the intercooled run which was interesting so Run uh, at 11 pounds or so, this thing made 653 horsepower, non-intercooled, and 599 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, just as a point of reference, here's what it looked like when we ran 7 pounds non-intercooled. And you can see it offered big gains everywhere, you know, as we would expect when we go up and boost. But here is our comparison when we ran the thing at 10.5 pounds with the intercooler. So we had gains, um, you know, but the thing that we were worried about is I could not adjust this thing the precise amount to get these boost curves to be exactly the same. I'll show you what I mean. So this is, uh, this is about a half a pound difference or so, and here's what happened. I could lower the boost controller by a half pound because those are the increments that we had. And this is what we get. The blue line it made quite a bit less, obviously, than the intercooled run, which is what we expect. Um, and you, and, but this shows something interesting, that if you raise the boost, obviously, you can make up the difference between intercooling and non-intercooling. You can run more boost, but you can look at it the other way, that you have to run more boost <laughs> to make the same power as you do just with the intercooler. And I want you guys to look down here in this area, if you can watch the cursor down in the 3,000-3,500 range. The interesting thing was, even without changing anything, 
the addition of the intercooler improved the boost response. So here, this big difference you're seeing here in power down 3,000 to 3,500 is actually a change in boost because with the intercooler, this combination wants to make more power and more boost on the load in with the intercooler, which is kind of interesting. And we, you can see, we, even though we ran consecutive runs here at a little bit different boost level, it didn't change the response at all. But putting the intercooler on definitely changed the boost response, which is cool. Uh, before I go and we take a look at the charge temperatures, I want to talk about the timing a little bit. At this higher boost level, we had slightly less timing. Both of, All of these had the same timing curve. But compared to the seven pound run, the timing on the 10, 10 and a half pound run was actually a little bit less. We started out at uh, 12.2 at 3,000, and then we wound up at 19.5 uh, out at the top of the out here at the top of the RPM range. So let's take a look at the charge temperature difference at 10 and a half pounds. Here is the charge temperature curve on the this is the 11 pound run, so the highest one. And we can, uh, we started off at 110 degrees and rose to a peak of 185 degrees. Just as a point of reference, here's what it looked like in comparison to the, to the seven pound non-intercooled run. So it rose obviously at a much higher rate. The start point was a little bit different probably from uh, the start point of just sitting. Um, but here's what it happened after we added the intercooler. Once again, just like with the seven pound run, we started off with the intercooler at 66 degrees and rose to a peak of 85 degrees. So we had about, about a 20 degree change with the intercooler uh, in the manifold. But you can see now there's a difference of 100 degrees at uh, 10 and a half pounds or 11 pounds in the case of the non air cooled one right here. We have a 100 degree difference in charge temperature between the two. That again is power, but it's also a safety margin. 100 degrees can really make a difference. So we get, let's take a look and see what happened at our slightly lower boost on the non intercooled run. It actually, the charge temperature wasn't much different because you're only talking about a half a pound. So you have variations between the runs, but you know, 100, 185, 186, um, that's kind of where the thing wanted to run. And it depends on how quickly we do backup runs and stuff. It might start, you know, a few degrees hotter or whatever, but it always ends up about right there. So again, 100 degree charge temperature difference between the intercooled and non intercooled runs. But obviously, as we've shown, <laughs> if you just raise the boost, you can make more power. Just in case you guys didn't get enough data, here is the back pressure versus, versus boost pressure curve. This was on the non intercooled one, but it ba basically is the same for both of them. We can see that the crossover point here. This flat line here, if you follow the cursor, is the boost pressure. And this rising curve, starting at four and a half pounds or so and climbing up to 8.7 pounds, is the back pressure. So the back pressure offered by that 7875 Gen 2 Turbo was lower than the boost pressure all the way to 5500 on this combination. And only then did it get a little bit above. Um, I know that this boost curve looks a little jaggedy, and that's just a function of the sensor from the dyno. The boost curve was not that jaggedy, <laughs> otherwise we would see big changes in the power curve. But watching the, the mechanical boost pressure gauge and the, the boost controller on the, the electronic boost controller, everything was nice and flat. I don't know why the dyno is not getting a good signal there. But this is our boost pressure versus back pressure curve at 7 pounds. So let's take a look at one of them at, let's say, 10 pounds. Same kind of thing. We have a rising curve um, starting at about seven pounds because we had turned the boost up. It rose all the way up to a peak of a little over 12 pounds on the back pressure. And the boost curve was you know, fairly consistently flat in the 11s or so, went all the way down to 10.8 or, or so. Crossover point was about at the same RPM right here at about the 5,500 RPM range. Interesting that this turbo makes less back pressure than boost pressure for most of the curve. And even out here, it's not dramatically higher. So you're talking about 12.2 uh, versus 10.8. You know, that's really not very much. These are our back pressure and boost pressure curves. Let's get to our conclusion. Okay, guys, what's the takeaway from this test comparing intercooled versus non-intercooled on our E85 4.8 liter? There's actually two things. First of all, intercooling always works. Whether you run it with pump gas or E85 or race gas or even methanol, 
intercooling will always cool the charge temperature. A cooler charge temperature is always better. So big yes on intercooling. But the flip side to that, running E85, especially at these boost levels, obviously works. And you can always turn the boost up just a little bit more to make up the difference between non-intercooled and intercooled. So that's always an option. E85 works very well. I always like intercooling, but obviously you can run it without. I'm Richard Holman, guys. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. Lots more 4-8 turbo testing coming up.